with Jonah. Jonah goes to Nineveh, preaches. To his great surprise, the entire city repents. Even though he thought it could happen, Jonah is, is furious. Except for Messiah, Jonah has to be the most successful minister in history. And yet the most miserable over his success. He's furious because he wanted judgment on the Assyrians. So now it says, verse 6, And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah. God intervenes again, causes a plant to come up, gives Jonah shade, but then God intervenes again. Verse 7, But God prepared a worm. When the morning came, the worm ate the gourd. Jonah's not happy again. Then God intervenes another time. Jonah 4, verse 8. It came to pass when the sun rose, God prepared a strong east wind, and Jonah is not happy again. Now, what does that have to do with today, where we are? Well, turn to one more scripture, Psalm 90, the Psalm of Moses. We read it last night. The Psalm of Moses, actually, you don't have to turn because I'm going to focus on one verse, but you should know it. It's in the Psalm of Moses, Psalm 90, where he says, the key, teach us to number our days, O Lord. We can have a heart of understanding. Teach us to number our days. Now we understand that. We are to number our days. It's important to number your days. You don't have forever. Number your days and, and know how long you have and know that you don't have forever. So do what you have to do now. We are here for a limited time only. So do that and that, and that changes the way you look at life. But here's the thing. In Jonah, when it says in Jonah 1, 17, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. The word for prepared is the Hebrew word mana. Try it. <laughs> when it says in, in Jonah 4, 6, the Lord prepared a, a plan. He made it come up over Jonah. The word is mana. Jonah 4, verse 7, when it says the Lord prepared a worm to eat the plant, it's mana. And when it says the Lord prepared a wind to come, it is mana. Mana is what God did with the fish. It's what God did with the plant. God did with the worm and God did with the wind. God manad the fish, manad the plant, manad the worm, manad the wind. But here's the thing. It says in Psalm 90, in the Psalm of Moses, teach us to number our days. But the word in Hebrew is mana. Same word as in the book of Jonah. In other words, God manad the fish. What he did, when he manad the fish, you are to mana your days. God manad the plant, you are to mana this year. As God did with the wind, you are to do with 2016. How? It says, teach us to number our days, but it's mana our days. That means what God did in Jonah... That is what we are to do. There's so much revelation here. You can translate it as teach us to prepare our days. Prepare our days. Now you can only, you can only prepare something if it's not here yet. It says prepare our days. You know, we think of days, you know, they come and that's all you just, you know, here's the next day it came. But here it says in the Bible, prepare our days. How do you prepare our days? That's why it says teach us to. We have an idea that just, you know, the days come. What's going to come in 2016? What's going to happen to you? What's going to happen in the world? What will happen in America? What will happen to you? Well, we don't know everything that's going to happen. We don't know all the details of what's going to happen. What will it bring? But whatever happens, see, we, we have no control over our days. We think they just come. And if a good day comes, then we have a good day. If a bad day comes, I'm having a bad day, then, a, then we had a bad day. Or a good year, it was a, or the world, it was a bad year. But that's not biblical. Not biblical. You see, we cannot say what each day will bring. Or whether the, but, but whether the day is good or bad, we can say. That's different. You've got power over that. It's not dependent on the day or the circumstances of the days or the year. It's dependent on you in God. Proverbs 15 verse 15 says... All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Think about that. Now, a natural way of thinking is the opposite. It should read this way. If we were writing it in the natural, it should read this way. Those who have evil days, bad days, are afflicted. But it doesn't say that. It says the days of the afflicted are evil. 
And it should read, he who has a continual feast has a cheerful heart. It doesn't say that. It's the opposite. He who has a cheerful heart will have a continual feast. In other words, we naturally think it's the day or the circumstance that determines good or bad. It's what happens in the day. That's what, but the day determines whether you're going to be happy or sad. But the Bible says it's the opposite. It's the afflicted who determine the day being bad. And you see, the affliction, the afflicted here means as an identity, or, or that's how you would take it. The people who are always in an afflicted state, afflicted spirit, complaining spirit, spirit of a victim, negative spirit, spirit of being oppressed all the time. All the days will be bad. The days follow the spirit. The days follow the heart. But he who is of a cheerful heart will have a continual feast. All their days will be good. The days follow the spirit, the time, what happens follows, whether it's good or bad, follows the heart, follows the attitude. Two people live in the same day, but one for one the day is evil, bad, and for the other the day is good. It's the heart that makes the day, not the day that makes the heart. So it's not a matter of this year, what will this year bring, or what will the days of this year bring. You've got a choice. No matter what happens in the day, you've got a choice. No matter what happens this, in this world, in this nation, in your life, you've got a choice. You can have a good year, regardless of what happens around you. That's part of the secret. Teach us to prepare our days. When God prepared the fish, the fish became an active agent in the story to bring things into God's will. When he prepared the plant, the worm, the wind, each became an active agent to bring about the purpose of God. Now, the fish existed before God prepared it in this way, as did the worm. It doesn't say God suddenly created them in that, way, that day. He prepared them. They existed. Before he prepared them, they were just doing their thing. The fish was swimming. The worm was worming, crawling, being a worm. But when God prepared them, they became agents of God's will, active agents. So too, days are days. In a, in a sense, they're neutral. That's why you need to prepare them. When you prepare your days, you're making them active agents. You're setting them. You're committing them to accomplish the will of God. Notice God is not passive in the story of Jonah. He's active continually. It wasn't the fish that had its way. It wasn't the worm that had it. It was God's will that had its way. He prepared it. So the days are not to have their way over you. The circumstances are not to have their way over you. They're not to determine whether you're sad or happy or frustrated or blessed. You are to have authority over your days in God, in his will. Not that you can determine everything that happens in your life. You cannot. But you can determine whether the day is good or bad for you. You can prepare a day to commit the days to serve the purposes of God. If you live in the will of God, in the will of God is the authority of God. Then even days submit to God and to those who are in God. Paul was in prison. Paul was, was, was beaten and yet he had a good life. The days did not determine Paul's life. Paul in God determined his days. You are not supposed to be a passive player in this world. Acted upon by circumstance. Determined by what happened. Determined by your childhood. Or determined by the problems. You're to be active. Acting upon the world. What does God say? What did Messiah say? You are not the mirror of the world. You are the light of the world. Light acts upon the world, acts upon circumstance, not circumstance on light. You're, you know, light acts upon whatever it is, so you're not determined by what's around you. You're not supposed to be. You are the light. You act upon. How do you prepare your days? Another secret you'd only see in the Hebrew. First Chronicles 9, verse 29 says this. Talking about the Levites in the temple of Solomon. Some of them were appointed to oversee the vessels and all the instruments of the sanctuary. Levites were put in charge. Some of the Levites were put in charge, ordained, appointed for this. Well, the word here for appointed for ministry is mana. Same word. The same word. It means they were appointed for ministry. 
Teach us to appoint our days, ordain our days. How do you prepare your days? Before they happen, you appoint them for God. The word in, in Chronicles, mana, appointed for ministry. You appoint your days for the, not so you can have not so you can have easy days, not can you have this and that, but that every day will serve the purposes of God in your life. It doesn't matter, you know, it's a point that days are not just neutral, that whatever happens, you are committed that everything's gonna, gonna go into the will of God. The, the good things that come your way, the bad things that come your way, I'm appointing it, I'm anointing this. I'm, think about that concept. You can anoint your problems, appoint your problems. To serve the will of God. Instead of complaining about the problems, that doesn't do much good for God. But say, Lord, I am committing this problem into your hands to serve you. And to accomplish your will in my life. God is already committed to working things for good. But we need to be working with him. We need to be in agreement with him. Makes it that no matter what, in every circumstance, you're going to give thanks. Because everything is for God's will. It means in all things. You know, when you see something, you know, every day this year you can say, okay, what is this bringing about for my life, for my growth, for my redemption, my restoration, for my blessing? What is it? There is something here whether I see it or not. It means all your days will be holy. because Not because they seem holy or that everything in it is holy or, is, or all the people are holy. No, but God will work it to holiness. God wants you in the process. Ordain them for ministry. Tonight is the first fruit of this. And we're going to mana this year for God. Mana your days for God's holy purposes, for purity in your life, for holiness in your life, salvation, restoration, blessing. But something else. It's not just prepare the days for us. It's to prepare us for the days. Not just to appoint the days for us, but to appoint ourselves for the future. To appoint not just this year for us, but appoint us for the year. We are to appoint not only the days for the purposes of God, but appoint ourselves for the purposes of God. And that's why we are having this service tonight we would have a service no matter what, but this is the service for this reason. Each year on the first day, I would anoint the ministers for God's purposes. At the building, it's a meeting of just the ministers. And then we anoint the building, we anoint that. But today, we're going to anoint everyone. As long as you're a believer. If you're not a believer, get saved, then we'll anoint you. But what is the anointing? What is the anointing? It begins with... An olive tree. Olive tree bears the fruit of the olive. The olive is crushed, and from that crushed olive comes olive oil. Olive oil. Olive oil is what is used to anoint. The word in Hebrew to anoint is mashach. Try it. This thing of anointing is crucial. Who was anointed in the Bible? Who did they anoint in biblical times? Number one, they anointed the priest. The priest was anointed. Before he could minister, he had to be anointed. The priest had to be anointed. You have to be anointed for ministry. The priest also anointed the tabernacle and the altar, the things of God. They anointed the ministry. Interesting because, you know, those things are inanimate objects. They don't have will, but they still were anointed. You can anoint things in your life to be used for the Lord, just as we anoint the building. Anoint. You can even, again, again, anoint anything in your life. But what was the point of the anointing? To set apart that which is anointed, to sanctify it, make it holy, consecrate it, declare it is consecrated for the purposes of God. It's a holy vessel. It is anointed for the purpose of God and not for any purpose, not just to do whatever, it but for the purpose of God. It just, the priest was anointed, meaning he, can't just, he couldn't just do whatever he wanted with his life. He couldn't just hang out. There were special things about his life. There were things he couldn't do and things that he was to do. 
because he was anointed. If you're going to be anointed, if you're going to walk in the anointing of God, you have to, you have to walk with the fact that it's not just, hey, I got anointing, I've got power. That's not it. It's about I am anointed for the will of God. That means there are things I can't do and there are things I must do. I am, my life is to be a holy vessel for God. The priest was now, it was a holy vessel, sacred, set apart for the purpose of God. That which is anointed is set apart for God. Who else was anointed? The king was anointed. And first Samuel, Samuel the prophet is grieved because Saul has fallen away from God. And so he, God says, don't be grieved, go and I'm, we're going to have another king. So he goes to Bethlehem. And he sees the, the family of Jesse and all the brothers and he looks and God says, don't look on the outside. Don't be impressed by the size. But it's not these. He says, do you have any other? Well, there's one young one out there. They bring him in. They bring him David, David. He sees David. God says, this is the one. Anoint him. What happens? He anoints him. He might have had a horn of oil. We don't anoints David, the least likely, and David is going to be the king of Israel. The anointing is the first thing that does it. The anointing, and then he's going to be king, and all he's set apart now. David is set apart for all the purposes of God. He is anointed to be the king. Now he's going to see a lot of resistance. A lot of things are going to go all different ways. Things will look bad, but it's all going to be leading to that. The anointing is linked to bringing about the purposes of God. God told Elijah, anoint the man Jehu. Jehu would be anointed to bring judgment to the house of Ahab and then become king. But there's something else here. And of course, you know, there are times the anointing just com comes on. Well, there, the, the something else here, what does the olive oil speak of? What is the olive oil about? What is the anointing about? The olive oil is a physical vessel that represents a spiritual reality. It represents the Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh. The anointing of the oil represents the anointing of the Spirit. Oil flows, the Spirit flows. I remember I once went to a, a guy we heard on the radio, we were new believers, and we went to, he had an a old-fashioned revival tent meeting. Some of you actually know who remember this man. And he's preaching and preaching. And at the end, he says, so now we're going to have the anointing. And so we said, okay, that sounds good. We went up. And it was like a, kind of like a, an assembly line thing. You walk through this thing and they, they usher you through. And there's a lot of people. But this guy didn't just do like a little thing like this. This guy, they, had, they must have gone to the supermarket, gotten all this Wesson oil. And boom, like it was flowing. We're flowing. It's all over, everything wet, we're greasy, we're this, we're... And, and it was actually, it was actually pleasant, except that we ruined all our clothes, but it, it was, it, the oil flows, it's a symbol of the spirit flows, the spirit, the, the oil anoints, the spirit anoints, the oil signifies special, holy, set apart, the spirit signifies special, holy, set apart, and look at the connection in the Bible. It says, Samuel anointed David, and it says, he anointed him with the oil, and what happened? The Spirit came on him. The oil, the Spirit. In Isaiah 61, listen, listen to what it says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he has anointed me. To proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the broken, proclaim freedom of the captives, Release from darkness the prisoners and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit of the Lord God has anointed me to do what? To do the will of God. That's the anointing isn't so you can do whatever you want. It's, it's not so you have power over other people. The anointing is for you to do the will of God. Proclaim the good news, gospel. Bind up the broken. Set the captive free. Proclaim God's favor. How did Messiah begin his ministry? Messiah, now remember in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, before they began their ministry, they had to be anointed. How did Messiah begin his ministry? He began his ministry at the Jordan River. And what happened? 
the Spirit of God came on him. The Spirit came on him, and then after that, after the wilderness, he went to the synagogue for the first time to open up his ministry. They gave him the scroll. It was Isaiah. And what did he read in that synagogue? What he read, no accidents in God, was the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the broken, set free the captives. And then he closed it and he said, Today in your hearing this scripture is fulfilled. He began it with the anointing of God. That is so biblical. Well, you'd expect him to be biblical. Saying he was anointed by the Spirit of God. Then the ministry begins. Everything begins with the anointing. Who is he? He is called the Christ. What does that mean? Christ comes from the Greek word oil. It's a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach. What does Mashiach, Messiah, sound like? Mashach, the word you just said, anointed. Mashach, put a little variation, becomes Mashiach, the anointed one. So anointing must be very important for us because we follow our faith centers on the Mashach, Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one. In whom is the anointing of God? He is the anointed. He is the most anointed. He's the epitome of the anointed. His name means anointed, his title. He is the most set apart for God. He is the most holy, sacred vessel of the purposes of God. What was he anointed for? To bring freedom, to bring good news, to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring liberty, to bring grace, salvation. He is the anointed. What does the anointing of God do? What happened when the Spirit of God came upon the people of God? When the Spirit of God came upon in ancient times, it says the Spirit of God came on them and they started to prophesy the gift. When the Spirit of God came on Samson, he didn't prophesy. He went crazy. But he became mighty. He, he was able to do mighty things and ultimately defended Israel, even despite himself, the anointing work to defend Israel against the Philistines. He was given power. The Spirit of God came upon the man named, named Bezalel. Bezalel, it says what happened? He became wise. He became able. He was given knowledge and understanding by the anointing of God. So that he could build the tabernacle of God. All of a sudden, he didn't go to school. He just got it to do. What, so what's the anointing? The anointing allows you, enables you to do the will of God and to fulfill the calling of God on your life. The anointing of the Spirit gives authority. It gives ability. It gives giftings. When Messiah, you know, you see it in the Scripture you see Moses is going up the mountain, ending his ministry, but before he does, God has him give his, in a sense, his mantle on Joshua. And it says the Spirit came. And then Elijah goes up into heaven. He goes up to the heaven, and what happens? His mantle literally falls down and goes to Elisha, the anointing of Elijah upon Elisha. Messiah went up to heaven, ascended to heaven. So where was the mantle? Who did he anoint? Was it Peter? What, what was the, where's the mantle of Messiah? I mean, you think of all. He'd have the one. But there's nobody who got that mantle. And yet, everybody got it because... What was, the, what was the mantle? It came 10 days later on the day of Pentecost. That is the anointing. That's the mantle of Messiah. You'd think, you know, he could speak because he's so big, he's so great, he is the anointed. He can't just give it to one person. It's got to be given to everybody. And so the Spirit of God comes upon them. That's the day when they hear a, they, it's a, a sound of a mighty rushing wind the Ruach HaKodesh and, and tongues of fire and speaking in other tongues 
It's an anointing. That's, the, that, that's how big the anointing of Messiah is. Messiah's anointing. That means, you know, so what, why did it come then? It, that, it, that's exactly what it is. It's the anointing. It's the spirit. It's light, it answers to the oil. Why did it come then? Because remember, the anointing comes before ministry or before you're going to do something. It's enabling you to do something. So it came at the beginning of Messiah's ministry. Now it comes at the beginning of the church, the people of God. They're about to minister, but they can't, you can't minister without the anointing. That's why it came on that day. And so what, anno- what came when he's talking about the Holy Spirit? That was the anointing of Messiah that came on them. It's his anointing, same anointing on his life comes on them. So the thing is, because Messiah is so big, no one person gets it all, but everybody is to get part of it. That means there is an anointing for your life that is part of the anointing of the Messiah. And only, you know, you know there are things that might be similar, but only you, there's an anointing especially for you. That nobody else could, has the same exact anointing. You have that anointing. But together, it's the anointing of Messiah. It's the body of Messiah. But it's the anointing that you have. So what is the anointing that he gives for your life? The anointing he gives is the power to fulfill your calling for which you are placed on earth. It is Messiah's anointing that fulfills your calling. His anointing. And the more you live in Him, the more you fulfill your calling. God made a promise in the Hebrew Scriptures. He said in that day, I will put my spirit within them and I will cause them to walk in my ways. What does the spirit do? Above all, does it make you act crazy? Depends. I mean, on, you know, for some people, anything that's weird, that's the spirit. No, that's not necessarily the spirit. It, the Spirit of God, above all, causes you to walk and do the will of God. It's His Spirit. It does His will. It causes you to walk away from that which is not the will of God. It causes you, not, it anoints you not to walk in sin, but to walk in the way of God, the, to please God. That's what the Spirit does. To start turning you away from the unholy things because it's a Holy Spirit and causes you to start doing holy things and actually desiring holy things and not desiring the other things. Start doing pure things. It causes you to stop thinking unholy thoughts and start thinking pure thoughts or moving in that direction. It causes you to want the will of God. You say, well, well how come in my life it's well? It's as much as you let because you have a choice. But that's the anointing of the Spirit, to rejoice in what's good and to stop rejoicing in what's not. It cleanses you, it ennobles you, makes you become what God created you to become. And the word used in the Bible speaking about the Spirit or what the Spirit gives, as you many of you know, is dunamis. And dunamis comes from not, not just do we get dynamite from it, which we do, but dunamis from the Greek root dunamahi, which means literally, I can. It is the power to say, I can. Not as a political slogan, but a reality that I actually can. In other words, it gives you the power to become able to do what you could not do before the anointing. The power to do everything you need to do to fulfill your calling Nothing left over that you can't do. That's why it says, I can do all things through Messiah who strengthens me. The power to do the will of God. It's the power. It's the ability. It's the authority. Now, if our faith is in the anointed one, Messiah, if we are called messianic or Christian means the same thing, that means that we must also be anointed. Because what it means is, you know, I mean, of the Messiah means un, of the anointed. So if I am a, I am a Christian person, I'm a Messianic person, I am to be, I must be an anointed person. I must be a little version of him, anointed. That means you must live an anointed life. It's not just for people in the pulpit. It's for every one of you every day of your life. What does that mean? 
It means it's a life that has more power than can be explained by natural means. Yet you have more ability than you would have ever had. You have an anointing to do what you could never do. What, what, it doesn't match up that you could do it, but you do it. To do the ministry of Messiah, to do, to accomplish that, that you speak and it's bigger than your, you, you, can, you, can actually, you can actually do things that are above your strength. You can actually think things that are above your ability to think, your wisdom. Say things that you could never have known. It's totally Messiah's ministry and it's totally the fulfillment of your calling, the purpose of your life. Some of you are anointed to teach, some to evangelize, some to encourage some to counsel, some to help, some to administrate, some to dance, some to sing, some to build, some to work on computers, some to work on television, some to serve food, some to clean up, some to whatever. Every one of you has a calling. Every one of you in Messiah, you have a calling, therefore you must, you must go in the anointing of God to fulfill it. You can't do it on your own or you're going to burn out. But you can do it with God. God's will for your life is you live a life of victory, of power, of holiness, of righteousness, of blessing and joy, and the anointing is to allow you to do just that. But you receive the anointing. How the key is, consecrate your heart, your mind, your will, your life for the will of God more than ever this year. Commit to walking on the highest ground of his will. Commit to fulfill your calling and to do whatever it takes to please God and turn away from that which grieves God. Commit to becoming a vessel of God set apart for his holy purpose, a holy vessel. So it says, if anyone will cleanse themselves of these things, it doesn't say if someone has dirty dirt that's finished. It says, no, it says if anyone cleanses themselves, he will become a vessel of honor for the high purposes of God. Believe the power of the anointing. Believe that by his anointing, by his spirit, you can do what you couldn't do. And receive the anointing from God himself. If you consecrate yourself to the will of God, and you open yourself up to the power of God, the Lord will give the anointing of God to fulfill your life, fulfill your call, that you will be able to say, just as the one who is the center of our faith in whom we live, that you too, as a little version of him, you will be able to say, the Spirit of the Lord God has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, bind up the broken, proclaim freedom to the captives, release from those in darkness, to overcome every obstacle, to roll away every hindrance, to overcome every problem, to win every battle in God, to break every chain. I am anointed to open every prison door, to not be overcome by this world. I am anointed to overcome this world, to walk with authority over my circumstance, to bring the lost to salvation, to become mighty for God, to put a thousand of flight, to become a holy vessel, a royal priest, to rejoice at all times, to walk in right Righteousness. I am anointed to do what I could have never done, to achieve what I could have never achieved, to do above my strength, to know above my wisdom, to live above my life, to become great in the Lord, to live a life that glorifies his name. I am anointed to do all things through Messiah who strengthens me and to overcome the world. That is the blessing, the promise, and the inheritance of the one who is anointed of the Lord. Amen. We live in a world that is filled with adversities, problems, troubles, obstacles, and we live in the end times on top of it with special challenges, special opposition. And we live at a very critical time now with much shaking in the world and uncertainty. And you've got the adversary against you. You've got the world against you. You've got the problems against you. You've got obstacles against you. You've got the enemy against you. You've got those whom the enemy influences against you. You've got the flesh against you. You've got your old nature against you. So how do you live a life of victory? I'm going to share tonight the keys of overcoming, the keys of victory. 
in all things, in the end times, but it applies not just in the end times, because it's for any situation of problems, adversity, trouble. And this is the first time, you know, I'm going to be gathering into one message many keys. You might have heard me touch on some of them at different things, but it's going to be in one thing. So it's going to be like a, this message will be like a victory pack or the keys, a chest, a chest for the keys of victory to draw from. Any one of them applied can give you victory. I'm going to go quick. The keys of victory, not apart from trials and troubles, but in the midst of them, how to overcome. I go fast. I may not enumerate each one. I may not number each one. First, the first keys are foundations. Number one, God's will is that you overcome. God's will is that you prosper in Him, and God's will is that you are victorious. That remains His will in every situation. There is no situation where God has not willed that you do not overcome. Every situation, no matter what. And it is for no matter where you live, no matter what time, you, whether it's in persecution, it doesn't matter. His will is still that you be victorious. Number two, a prosperous and victorious life in God is not dependent on what happens around you, not dependent on what you have in this world, not dependent on how much you have, not dependent on your bank account, nothing, not on what's going around you. It is independent of that. Some people preach and believe a prosperity that is, means that I am prosperous if I have things, I own things, or I am victorious if I get that victory. That's not what victory is about in God. The victory in God is independent of what happens in the world. You, are, you don't become victorious because you had victory. You have victory because you are victorious. That's the difference. Number three, God not only wills for you to have victory, the power of God is the power of victory, of becoming victorious. It is the strongest power, stronger than any problem or anything that will ever be against you. The, the power of overcoming, not only does he have that power, but he gives you the power to overcome. So not only does he will for you to overcome and call you to overcome, but he gives you the power to overcome in every circumstance. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. 2 Corinthians 2, But thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Messiah and manifests us, in us the sweet aroma of it, the knowledge of Him in every place. He always leads us to triumph. That's not, that is not partial, it's not modified, it's not qualified, it's always, in, it means in every circumstance, God is always leading you to victory. In the end times, there will be more challenges for believers, but that means more opportunities to overcome. The more opportunities to be victorious, the more problems you have, the more opportunities you have to be victorious. What do we know about the end times? Perilous times, great shaking, Love of many growing cold. Apostasy, you can see it. Persecution, you can see that coming. Evil increasing. On the other hand, the gospel shall be preached to all nations. The Spirit of God shall be poured out on all flesh. Having said that, what are the keys to being victorious, especially in times of shaking or times of trouble? I want to share this, I was, which God showed me once. I was once at a Christian event that took place near the ocean. And I decided to go swimming in the ocean, but it was the wrong time. The water became stormy. Waves, large waves, I mean, sweeping me up and down, sweeping me. I'm in the midst of being swept up and down, and there's another head in the water going up and down. Sees me and says, are you Jonathan Kahn? <laughs> I said, not now. He said, that depends. He says, you are Jonathan. Can I have some counseling? I'm thinking like, oh my goodness. I'm trying to stay alive here. Here, I'm saying here. He said, I want to know, and we're going up and throughout this, got a picture throughout the whole time, we're going up and down. I want to know, up and down, down, you know, uh, how I can become stable. <laughs> My walk isn't stable, and I, and I find myself being tossed all over the place as we're being tossed all over. Back and forth, he's going, how do I become steadfast, how do I become strong? 
And he's saying that, and I'm going up and down, and he's going up and down, and he wants me to tell him how to be stable. And I notice there's a rope in the water. It's a really thick rope, gigantic rope, that is tied to, I think, like the dock or the cement, and it's bound on both sides. So I swim over to it. I grab hold of it, and I say, come over here. Hold on to this rope. And he's telling me, okay, tell me now, how, how, can, how can I be strong? How can I be stable? I say, okay, but grab hold of that rope. We can't talk unless you grab hold of that rope. And it hits me, the Lord. The answer's right there. If you're in the middle of waves, shaking, problems, things going up and down, you're going to go up and down as well or toss back and forth unless you are anchored to something else. You jo- what does anchoring mean? You join yourself to that which is not going up and down, that which is more solid than you are, more stable than you are. And this is a key for the end times. The end times will be times of shaking. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So the next key is to not be shaken. The key is being all the more anchored, rooted, bonded to that which cannot be shaken. You know, if you, if you had a, a, a super glue, if you had, if you had a penny, or you know, people do this actually, you have a quarter or a half dollar, and they actually, there are people who do this as a, a prank, and they actually super glue it down to like a rock or down to a sidewalk, and people go down and they can't get it up. Well, the thing is that, think about that. A penny or a quarter doesn't weigh much. But if you super glue it, if it becomes totally bonded to a boulder, it becomes as heavy as the boulder. Because all the weight of that boulder is joined to the coin. So the coin becomes as, as heavy as the boulder by virtue of its being bonded to it. So that tells you something right there. God is the rock. God is the, mo- the heaviest thing in existence. Immovable, reality, solid, not going to move, not going to be shaken. And the key is we're like the coin. The more you bind yourself to God, the more you become as solid with God's weight. The weight of God. It, it's all dependent on how much you bond together. If you're not really bonded, then it's not so. But if you bind yourself, then you become as strong or as you become as heavy. You, all God's strength becomes yours. That's why it says be strong in the power of His might. So along those lines, now some specifics. Number five. You know, the, Jew, the Orthodox Jew wears tefillin. What is that? The phylactery. What is that? They put the, they put the box. There's a, it's a leather black box that they'll put on their forehead and wrap it around. And they're taking very super literally the command that says, you will bind my word to your forehead. Bind it. Bind it. So they literally have a box, a leather box. Inside is a word, a scroll, a parchment that's on their forehead. But, you know, that's what they do. But There's something deeper that's physical, but God is ultimately speaking about something spiritual. And what is that saying? To be stable in God, bind the Word of God to your thoughts. As much because you want to be stable, you have to bind your thoughts to the Word of God. That's the same principle of the superglue. You you bind what can go up and down, you bind it to what cannot be moved. See, if not, your mind is just going to go along with everything else. Things go up and down, your mind goes up and down. And you'll never, be, you'll never be grounded. You want victory, you have to have victory in your mind. One of the first keys about your mind is, your mind does not control you. You choose what you want to think about. Your mind is an instrument. It's an instrument that you use, just like you, you say, well, I don't have any control over my thoughts. Yes, you do. I mean, thoughts have, thoughts have an inertia to them, but you have control over your hand. You can open it. You can close it. I mean, there may be things coming in influencing them, but the Bible says, gird your mind. Your mind doesn't control you. You have control over your thoughts. And if you, it says, the Bible says, take every thought captive, and as you change your thoughts, you will change your mind. And if you change your mind, you will change your life. It may take time, but the more you exercise your mind, focusing, choosing the thoughts of God, the more your mind will 
will dwell on the will of God. Take the word of God, bind it to your thoughts, more and more train your mind to, to be fixed to the word of God. Don't just let your mind go all over the place. Don't let your mind be led by its own thought. Don't let your mind be led by emotions. You'll never be stable. But let have your mind grounded on the word of God and you'll become strong. Number six, binding. Next thing of binding, all the more. To bind your heart, bind your life to the presence of God, in the presence of God, to get plugged into God in prayer, in communion, in the presence of God, to get dwelling on Him at all times. That's going to make the difference of whether you're going to stand or fall. When you look at all the great people of God, you wouldn't think so. People don't think so. They don't think that people of prayer are very worldly good, but it's the opposite. The people who were the most powerful people in the world, in the Bible, were people strong of prayer. Moses, all the time in the presence of God. Elijah, it says, the Bible says he was a man of prayer. The greatest victory took place on Mount Carmel when he was in prayer. Paul was a man of prayer. He, he had visions. He went into trances, and yet he was so down to earth and practical. So at the end times, in times of opposition, it is all the more crucial that you get plugged into the presence of God. Practice being in the presence of God. I cannot emphasize this enough. It is the secret of all the strength that comes at your time with God. Number seven, the Orthodox Jew doesn't just put the word on his forehead, but also puts it on his arm, those phylacteries, those tefillin. He puts it on his arm. Why? Because God said, bind the word of God to your arm. Well, what does that mean? It's not such a, a, about physical things. It's about the word of God. What is your hand? Binding it to your hand. Your hand is your actions. You work, you move with your hand. You do things with your hand. So what is that talking about? Bind your actions to the word of God Bind the Word of God to action. God says, do something, do it. Do the Word of God, and it actually strengthens you. There's something especially powerful about doing this. The Lord gave a parable. A man builds his house on the sand, and it collapses. Another man builds his house on the rock. It stands in the midst of the storm. It says, and what is that? He says, the one who does my word... So is what? Is the man who builds his house on the rock. It's the same picture of binding to something strong. What does it mean? The more you do the will of God, there's something about it. It strengthens you to stand against anything. The, more, the one who does the word of God, who puts the word to action and joins his or her actions to the word, to the will of God, will be able to withstand any storm in life. Why? When you obey the word, when you do the word, you're joining the will of God to your mind, your will, your body, your muscles, your nervous system, your actions, your habits, your routine, everything, your memory, the word of God becomes totally joined to you. And so you're binding all these things to the word of God. You become grounded, strong. That means when you obey God's will, if there's something you're not obeying, you are, you are on shaky ground, but when you obey it, when you do what you know is God's will, you become solid. There's a power that comes with joining your life to the will of God. Next, number eight, emunah. Some of you know, some of you don't. The word for faith in Hebrew is emunah. Emunah, it's filled with riches because emunah comes from or also means truth. What is faith? It is truth come down. It's connecting yourself to the truth of God. Faith is grounded not on faith. Some people preach faith about faith. It's not about faith. Faith is about God. Faith is about truth. Faith is grounded to truth. And the word for truth also means, also means solid or steady and solid and powerful. Or, or it's, it's, it cannot be moved. Well, when, when you ground yourself by the more faith you have, the more grounded. And I'm not talking about faith that whatever I say is going to come true or faith in fantasy. But faith in the word of God, faith in God grounds you. Remember, no matter what it looks like, the one who is on the side of God is on the winning side. No matter what it looks like, fight the good fight, 
Don't live as if somebody, as, as if you're on the losing side, because you're not, even if it looks like you are, that's the whole fight of faith. Believe you're on the winning side. Believe for victory, you must. Believe for good to prevail. Believe it, be confident in it. And then act on it. Act as someone who is confident of victory in God. Live on the winning side. And lastly, a mystery about the end of the age. The age must close as it began. There was an Israel in the world then. Now, as then, Israel's back. There were Jewish believers and messengers of Messiah in the world. They're back. In the beginning of the age, there was an ungodly, anti-Christian, persecuting world culture. That's coming again. But there was a church made up of Jew and Gentile who were on fire for God. There was a book of Acts of people who could not be stopped or suppressed or oppressed, who opened prison doors, who lived all out in the shadow of the cross and the resurrection of Messiah, who were bold, who were unafraid, who were filled with the joy of salvation. There was a revolutionary faith of a revolutionary people who literally changed the world. God wants that again. The greatest revival can yet be ahead. We are not here to survive. We're here to revive, touch the world. You can do that because the Spirit of God is again being poured out in the last days. God wants to raise up a people of the book of Acts. For the same God of the book of Acts is our God here and now. And as He poured out His Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit in the beginning, He will so pour it out in the end. For the eyes of the Lord search all over the earth, looking for the one whose heart is completely His, that he might show himself mightily for that one. You be that one. You be that people. You be that man. You be that woman. And the greatest anointing will come upon your life. It's a good sign. You came tonight on a time when everybody's saying, can't come, it's a storm, stay inside. You didn't care about the storm. And that's good. God, God can use someone like that. If you'll say yes, not just to what's good, but yes to what is great and the greatest, highest calling, most glorious calling that He has for your life, then He will anoint you with an anointing that is high and glorious. It is time for us to live as they lived back then, to stand as they did, believe as they did. They did it so we have a witness to it. It can be done to keep going as they kept going, not to get overcome, not to get depressed, not to give up as they didn't to break through chains, to press on, to open prison doors, to blaze as they did back then, and to overcome the world. You want biblical times? You got them. They've arrived. These are the days of Elijah. It's time to get single-minded. It's time to get all out, and God will bless it. It's time to get radical. Time to, to, to when you look at the days ahead, don't fear. Know that truly the Bible said it and attach yourself, bind yourself to it that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And live in his will. You'll prevail. You'll overcome. You'll be victorious in the name above all names, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Greater than the darkness, greater than the world, greater than the devil, greater than your sin, greater than the powers of hell. The light of the world rise up in the calling of God and you will be victorious in the name of